Welcome to Coastal Front. Join us each week as we sit down with the movers and shakers of Vancouver to discuss stories of business, politics, accomplishment, and failure. Our aim is to keep you dialed into what matters most in our city. Now, here's your host, Andrew Johns. On today's episode of Coastal Front, I'm joined by one of the most prominent political figures in BC. He's the MLA for Vancouver Quilchina, the leader of the official opposition and BC's Liberal Party. He began his career as a medical doctor graduating from the University of Alberta before going on to graduate from law programs at both Dalhousie and Oxford University. In addition to his career in politics, he has practiced law at several prominent firms in Canada, including Harper Gray and McCarthy Tetro. I'm super excited in today's conversation to welcome Andrew Wilkinson. Thanks for being on the show, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, this has been uh, something I've been very excited about having you come on. For the listeners who are, are tuning in, um, I decided to narrow in on this discussion into three main topics uh, because, you know, a guy like you, we could probably, if you gave me the time and I had the time, we could sit here for probably five hours, but <laughs> it is late on a Friday and I think we both want to get to our families eventually. But um, so we decided to zero in on three topics that are important to me and I know important to a lot of the listeners that uh, listen to the show. One of them is transparency in government. Another one is tax policy. And then the third one is political messaging. Um, so why don't you pick which one you want to cover first? And then <laughs> well, I'll kind of give you Well, it depends whether you think your listeners and watchers are going to be keen to stay for the whole duration, in which case we could start <laughs> with freedom of information because it's pretty dry. Yeah. Or if they want to talk about tax policy and then maybe go watch the movie somewhere else. <laughs> Um, sure. Well, let's start at the top with transparency in government. Sure. Um, so I'm a, uh, I'll just start off with my points. I'm a huge agitator for uh, for transparency in government, and uh, I'm very familiar with the access to uh, information, the freedom of information process, which in BC is is actually generally pretty good compared to what it's like, say, at a federal level. Um, but I have found that the system in whole as a whole is quite complex. Uh, as you know, Andrew, I work in a market in an industry full of public companies that have to report uh, full, they have to be completely dis, uh, transparent, full disclosure with audited financials every quarter. By contrast, when I look at what goes on in the government, there seems to be an incredible amount of lack of information that you have to come almost pull out of the teeth of the government like I'm a dentist. And it's something that I think should be changed. I think that was one of the reasons that your government previously lost the last election on was a, a lack of, or at least a, a sense of transparency. Maybe that's not, a, it wasn't a fair judgment, but let's start with that. What are, what are your views on transparency in government? Is there enough here in BC today? Should there be more? If there is, what should it be? Yeah, you have to basically go back to the beginning to get perspective on this. Governments, of course, are enormous. There are 28,000 direct employees for the BC government. And if you add up all the people in the government payroll, it's about 300,000 when you get into hospitals and all the rest of it. So there's a vast amount of data and information that's collected. And when Freedom of Information was brought in in 1993, that was, of course, the paper era. And the premise was, if you want to hear about Labrador retrievers and you send in an information request, that will be sent to all the ministries and most of them will say, we don't have anything to do with Labrador Retrievers, so we don't have anything, and it comes back as zero records. They may not go and look for Labrador Retriever records because they assume that in the Ministry of Energy, they don't deal with Labrador Retrievers. But you will have the request go through, and they'll dig out files and come up with some records. And it's still the process where they're generally sent in and eventually convert into a paper format. And then they, somebody has to go through, usually on a computer screen, and redact all the private information. So you can see the repository of information is enormous, which is why it's so slow at the federal level. And yet other things are readily available online to people either generally in the public, like maps, or they're available like BC Center for Disease Control with the current pandemic. They have the daily uh, quote of lab test resorts and all that kind of stuff. They don't have the names of the individuals available to the public for obvious good reasons. Mm -hmm. So government has this problem that there's a stunning amount of information and they have to take out all the personal aspects of it before making it public. 
So you can say, well, that sounds like a stream of excuses for being slow and expensive and cumbersome. It's more of an explanation of why we should move to a different kind of freedom of information based on what's already in computer systems. Provide for automated searches. You know, I work both in government as the uh, deputy minister and minister responsible for freedom of information. I've also worked in large law firms where you're dealing with stunning amounts of records that have to be cruised through for litigation. They take very different approaches. The government approach is kind of mechanical, methodical, as if it were still on paper. The lawyer's approach is give me the entire hard drive and we'll put keyword searches into it. It's much faster, it's cheaper, it's not as tidy, and it generally works. And then you can redact the names out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the middle ground of what's done in litigation. And the best place to get to is what we see right now if you go on the BC Center for Disease Control website, bccdc.ca, mm -hmm. it just pulls up the data sets and you can click on them and get all the data you want that you're entitled to. So in the leadership campaign three years ago, I said, why don't we reverse the telescope on this? Rather than saying, send me a request and I'll see if we can find anything and we'll give it to you once you've had a good look and decided if you're entitled to it. Why not create a whole bunch of the data sets that matter, which are mostly financial yes. or numerical and don't need anybody's name associated with them and just make those available like BCC. Carte CDC. blanche to everybody. Yeah. And there's a That's exactly what I'm, I'm talking about. I mean, I, I don't need to know about how much a person got paid for providing a consulting service for the government. That so you much. should actually have information from well, like that. Anyway. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but I don't necessarily need to know who the individuals were. Or, yeah. But it's it, it starts with that because, you know, here's the thing, Andrew. I'm a big, I'm a firm believer that you can garner a lot of um, truth from financial statements. Yeah. And, and from financial data. Yeah. I mean, as an example, it's an incredibly difficult process for me to figure out how much you're spending on travel. Now, I think as a taxpayer in this province, especially if you were if you're a member of of the governing party that's running the province and you're on the road, uh, you know, flying around the country or flying around the planet for that matter, I should be able to find out with fairly de decent ease what you're spending your money on. Well, something that I am fully in favor of is mm -hmm. what of all people, Ralph Klein did, was when he went on the government website in the top left corner was ministerial travel and it was put up monthly. Bam, bam, bam. You click on the thing and you say, Minister sure. Jones, and you just get the travel report. Yeah. That stuff is actually not that useful to the average citizen apart from political accountability. The stuff I'm talking about is when Harry Baines, the Minister of Labor said, two weeks ago that there'd been a $3 billion loss on the worker work safe investment portfolio. I say, I want to know the answer right now. Right now. Sure. And we get referred back to a financial statement for the period that ended at the end of 2018 and they won't tell us anything more. Right. And I say, that's unacceptable. Nonsense. That's that un is not acceptable. Yeah. So under pressure from us, they put out their 2019 financial statement with their financial position to December 31, 2019. Their investment portfolio is held by BCIMC, which is the provincial investment mm -hmm. entity, manages all these pensions. They have the current state of the work safe portfolio by the week. Why won't you yeah. just tell me what that Absolutely. is? Absolutely. You, you, we're saying the same thing. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you were the premier of BC in the next election, become the premier of BC, you would advocate for this? Quantitative data, reverse the telescope and say, why wouldn't we just post this on websites as it becomes available? Water flow, okay. or river levels, snowpack, sure. financial statements. Yeah. Once they're audited by the, the accountants, put them on the website. You are absolutely correct in the sense that uh, BCCDC, which I'm actually very familiar with because I've been tracking the data myself and I download it and then I have my analysts on my team kind of chew manipulate, on it. chew on it. And it's very, very fascinating. Yeah. Uh, just more of a hobby thing. Uh, but let's let's go back to my reference of public companies versus the government. It would be completely unacceptable. In fact, you would be uh, disbanded from the from the exchange if you did not publish audited financials every quarter. And you mentioned a little bit earlier about this portfolio and how the originally you were given a statement from December thirty first of twenty eighteen. Correct. Would you, as premier of this province, advocate that all 
Cor uh, Crown Corporations of BC should be publishing at least semi-annual reports, especially in a time like this? Yeah, I see no problem with our financial entities that we as citizens supposedly own having a very similar or identical level of transparency and accountability as what is exists in financial markets. So why doesn't it happen already? That is one of those things where you look at those work safe statements and say, so you say you need to get through the audit for your 2019 statement and you won't be able to put it out until now, June of uh, 2020. And I say, well, what's the turnaround on corporate financial statements? If your year end was December 31, 2019, what's the period for an appropriate audit? And don't play political games with mm -hmm. it. Just post the thing. Mm -hmm. That's 45 days. That's generally the accepted. And I'm not yeah. in the audit business, so yeah. I wouldn't want to comment yeah. on what accountants can do in how many days. But you and I are saying the same thing. Yeah. Default to transparency rather than political convenience. Yeah. We don't want to put out that statement because it might cause a fuss. We'll do it on a Friday at 4 p.m. Nonsense. Mm -hmm. Have a, a day where statements are posted. Mm -hmm. I, I would even be comfortable with seeing a uh a set of quarterly statements that are unaudited because the reality is these accountants who run the different de departments of the provincial government and the different crown corps i know these accountants because they they they're accountants that are the same kind of accountants that work for me and the same kind of accountants that work for public companies and these people are on it they cannot have the roles they have and maintain their cpa designation yeah. and and not know the numbers as you described earlier right down to pretty much the day well, uh, this is what really got me about Harry Bain saying they lost $3 billion. His statement was that they lost $3 billion in financial markets uh, since the previous financial statements. You and I just looked on the TSX, the MCSI indices, yeah. and saw the date of the previous financial statement, the date today, yeah. and said, no, you that didn't. Possible? That's impossible. And so what, what was the answer to that in the end? He gave that information out on a Thursday. We called nonsense on the Friday and on the Sunday of all days, WorkSafe corrected him by saying there had been a $1 billion correction in the value since the market had slid down to March 23rd and then bounced back. So they had to correct him to the tune of $2 billion. I mean, what kind of public accountability is that? Imagine yeah. if you did that as the CEO of... WestJet or Tech yeah, Minerals, sure. you'd probably lose your job. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> now let's let's sort of twist this to the other other end of the freedom of information um, sort of spectrum where it gets abused or overused. Um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, David Eby is my personal MLA. As a for full disclosure, I voted for him, but I also donated money to your well, party. So we'll hope to change your mind today. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I did I did make a donation, you guys, and I do like the work that you guys are doing as well. So. Um, so, you know, I know David was a big advocate of leveraging that FOI all the time. And I think your party's probably doing the same thing. The media does it like crazy. In fact, when you go onto the BC, province of BC's list of freedom of information requests, data set or whatever, and you see who, you, it, it dis describes who the, um, the subscriber or the person the applicant. submitted, applicant, thank you. And it's almost like it's media, media, political party, media, political party. And then the odd time you might have like individual. And I almost wonder if on the other end of the spectrum, it's being it's it's chewing into tons of uh, of public labor and, and it's a lot of time being spent on this yeah. to dig up dirt is ultimately what I think the media and the opposing political parties likely trying to do. Otherwise, why would you be inquiring? Do you have any views on this? Yeah. Rephrase that. So. You set up FOI in this province in 1993, one of the most open systems in the country, it still is. So why do we have this? It's to make sure that the individual can, without charge, find out what government knows about them, their complete data set. Fair enough. It's not something that most of us would bother with, but people are entitled to do that. Secondly, it's to make sure that government is transparent and the truth will come out. That's why we have the media. That's why we have an opposition. So my view is that the opposition needs to have unlimited access to FOI to ferret out the secrets of government. What half often happens is we'll make an initial FOI request, something messy shows up, it cues us to a second FOI request and a third one, and then we find out they haven't been telling the whole truth about something. Right. Uh, a good example right now is the NDP in the middle of the pandemic cut $12 million out of the independent distance learning budget for kids who learn at home. This makes no sense whatsoever. So we have- And you only found that because you 
leverage the FOI? It was actually uh, one of the parents came to us and said, do you know what's happening with this? And we had no idea. So we had to go and ferret out this information. And then yesterday in the legislature, the education minister was kind of tr trying to cover his tracks until we read out the statements from the parents and he had to own up to the truth. So it's a very important function in a democracy. If you're going to have FOI, it has to be unlimited access for some sectors. You can argue about the media, whether it might be abused or not. Generally, it isn't. But there is the other factor that it, there's a ton of cost when a bunch of stuff is collected and brought in for these clerical people to review and redact. That's mm -hmm. expensive. Mm -hmm. So coming back to where we started, if you could take a whole bunch of that information, just put it up on websites in right. the first place. And if you want to go find out about the snowpacks in the Fraser uh, Forest Service District, it's right there. We just say, go to this link. Have a nice day rather than spending sure. $5,000 collecting information, redacting it, and reviewing it, and then mailing it to you. Yeah. Um, let's continue on this topic. And there's a, a legislation that's been put forward by the NDP. I don't know what stage it's at because of COVID, but it's called the Landowner Transparency Act. I did speak about this with David when he came on my show last year. And in layman's terms, I understand how this, what the, the intent of this is to uh, either validate or dispel this myth that the reason that Vancouver real estate uh, went up so much from call it 2012, 10, 2010, all the way till basically NDP came in and saved everybody apparently. No. Um, so, <laughs> so the reason that they come out with this is they wanna be able to validate how many foreign owners we have. And I see this as being a double-edged sword. I have often advocated in saying that I, I don't necessarily believe, I don't necessarily know, you don't know whether you know mainland Chinese really ran up prices in Vancouver or was that a result of like multiple decades of rock bottom interest rates, which are even lower now. I mean, you know, cheap debt for so long and um, it's, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. So I guess one of the upsides to this act and this getting this data is we will be able to finally determine that. You know, did, did the mainland Chinese represent 2%, 5%, 25% of the homes in the GVRD. Uh, but then the flip side, what I asked David about is I understand this is gonna be a public uh, website where everybody, I can look up Andrew Wilkinson and see exactly where you live. And when I asked David about privacy concerns, he said, well, you know, if you're a, an elected official or you're a celebrity, then you can request to have your name withdrawn. I mean, it reminds you of the old phone books where you eventually were able to finally have your name withdrawn. And for very good reason. Sure. Yeah. But if I'm not a celebrity and I'm not a politician, which I'm not, uh, but I don't want people knowing where my house is, uh, then like, where do you draw the line there? Sure. Let's take three angles on this. Sure. Start with what's the goal? Okay. Why do you want to do this? And if the idea is to find out about investment in the Vancouver real estate market from any source, what's it going to tell you once you get the information? If it's Andrew Wilkinson or Sally Bloggs or somebody with a name that appears to be non-Anglo, are you going to make some judgment call because they have a non-Anglo name that they're somehow someone that you think is inappropriate? That is racist by definition. But I don't think that's ever been the... Pause. There are 280,000 people with Canadian passports in Hong Kong right now. Okay. They're entitled to move back to Canada whenever they see fit because they have the same citizenship and the same passport that I do. Right. So is that a problem? Is that something that David Eby is trying to ferret out and say it's a bad thing? They are entitled as Canadian citizens to live here whenever they feel like it and buy whatever property they want to. Mm -hmm. So what do you intend to do about that, Mr. Eby? Well, you can't do it just based on name, Andrew. I mean, I don't think that's the, I would assume that's not the plan. How else is he going to do it? Well, you got to, no, you have to collect a name, but you have to have some other validation point than just a name. Such as? Social insurance number or, you know, what, what citizenship. Exactly. Right. Is that part of it? I don't know. I'm asking. Well, you tell me. What's what are you trying to discover by getting the name of a landowner? And it's all available anyway. You can go to any law firm. They just look on the sure. online systems and it comes up. It, yeah. This is no secret. Right. This is David Eby basically trying to identify people he considers to be bad people. And I question whether it's effective because mm -hmm. you got to figure out what the goal is and do something effective to get there. Right. Secondly, Vancouver's not alone. Auckland, New Zealand, Sydney, Australia, San Francisco, London, to a lesser extent, New York, uh, Geneva, Zurich, their property markets all went through the roof. Why? Because you in the financial sector know that because of quantitative easing in 2008 and 2009, a stunning amount of money was created in the world. And because of income inequalities, it drifted up into the people who owned assets. 
and they bid up the price of property. Mm -hmm. There's no surprise that properties are expensive in those safe, secure, pleasant cities, just like Auckland, New Zealand has gone through the roof, but Kamloops and Kelowna haven't. So you got to be clear about what the question is here and what the goal is you're trying to pursue. The third thing is the privacy aspect. There's a good reason why there are rules about obtaining certain kinds of information. Abusive spouses, police officers who are being traced down, chased down by organized criminals, people who are accused of various things who could become social pariahs and be chased down in their residence and terrorized. So these are very real things that happen in the real world. And it disappoints me to hear our attorney general dismissing them and saying, well, you can apply to have your name removed. Well, if you've got a spouse who's beaten you up four times and you've moved out and moved into a place that your mother bought for you, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. You're going to have somebody else's name on the title. Then David Eby accuses you of being a money launderer. So be careful what you wish for in this space right. and do it, figure out what the goal is and then find the means to accomplish the goal. Don't go on political witch hunts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so look, I'm going to speak not for David because I, I'm going to speak for myself, but I do like the idea and, and the, to a certain so I, I completely endorse your last comment about privacy. And, you know, the one end of the spectrum is you make it open, you make it available for everybody to see. There is no more privacy, but at least there's complete transparency. And that's the topic we're talking about here. The other end, and which is, again, another reason why I think you guys lost the last election is there the NDP, I, you know, in fairness to them, like did a damn good job of tying in unaffordable housing with foreign and buyers and that you guys were the reason for the, all this. And I, I see this data set, if we can coll collaborate together and get a proper data set together to I, actually quantify that. You know, there's other regions in the world, like for example, in Hawaii. What would you quantify? Well, I would be looking for, I don't even really care about the name. The name doesn't really matter too much to me. Although it's, you know, I look at, I look at the, take the same approach you work in a financial institution, which is where I work. Yeah, I'm asking you though what you would find by going through the registry, because you can do that at any law firm. Uh, okay, so you would look for, okay, so you can already get all this data through oh, a yeah. law firm. You okay. go to any real estate appraiser, real estate So agent. the government has this information. It's called LTO. Right. Land title office. And every one of those titles has the name of the registered owner. And okay. the way land titles work in British Columbia and yeah. in a few other places in the world like New South Wales, whatever name is on that title, they own it outright. So if you okay. come along and say, well, I actually own it and my name's in the title, I yeah. say, guess again, Yeah, my name's in the title, I own it. So is, okay, so tell me this then, uh, Andrew. So if I were the government and I wanted to um, create some good policy around housing, apparently this d data is already available as you're telling me. So why have we not been able to then already say, you know what, we already know how many of these homes are owned by foreigners and how many are owned by Canadian citizens. Mm -hmm. So let's use your group of, of uh, dual citizens out of Hong Kong. I don't care if they're dual. I, all I care about is the fact sure. that they're Canadian. Yeah, They're Canadian. If they so happen to have- you exempt so, all of them sure. because they are they're Canadian. just like you and me. 100%. Yeah. What I'm curious to know though, is do we, do we already have the data to be able to say, well, we know that you know in West Point Grey, where I live, there's like these 15 houses in this neighborhood who are all owned by foreigners. Do you know that? I don't, I'm asking you. You're Well, those declarations have been required since I think it's 2016. And if something went not have come to your attention is if you sell something in Canada with capital gains, you're not a Canadian citizen, then the, the lawyer who's doing the transfer is required to- Withhold tax? Withhold tax. Yeah. So that's already been happening for a long time. Okay, so withholding tax already exists? It didn't exists? suit David Eby's agenda. Okay, I didn't know that. So so if I'm a foreigner- Well, if I, you are a foreigner, come here and buy this building and then sell it three years later and take a capital gain, there's withholding yeah. tax. On residential as well? I'd have to check on that, but the yeah. premise has been there forever. Sure. Whether it actually happens is a compliance problem, yeah. not a problem of the structure of the legal system. Right. So you see the, the problem we get into is you start to say there are gray areas. The abused spouse you sure. can't be disclosing their yeah. ownership. But I'm not. I'm not arguing that one, Andrew. What the I'm celebrities talking celebrities who get harassed. But you you, can't you're, you're touching that. on privacy. Police officers. But that's privacy, and I think anybody with the sort of you know basic common sense would go, that's fair and reasonable. So who gets to be private? 
Well, that that's I mean that's for you to try and figure out. That's why you're in your role and I'm in my role. I don't know. I mean, I can I can definitely say this. I don't like I didn't like David's answer either. What I have to apply to have my name removed. I mean, I'll get it. I'll do that for sure because I'm dialed in on what's going on. But, but what happens? What about until the guy it gets who removed? It's out there for six sure. weeks. Sure. Yeah, hundred percent. And if you've got an but abusive let's, spouse let's go back, you down, but, but, that's let, not good. But let's just go back. Just finish up the transparency here. Let's go back to the core of this. The whole purpose. I mean, whether you, I mean, obviously you didn't agree with David's approach for valid reasons. Sounds like. But I'm just saying. Look, the objective here is to either validate or dispel this idea that foreign mainland Chinese or whatever they're coming from foreigners were rising, raising the prices of housing in Vancouver. Because that's kind of what they got elected on. They said, yep. you guys at the Liberals allowed these foreigners to run up prices and create all sorts of unaffordable housing everywhere. And I'm looking at going, well, let's get the data and prove it. Do you remember what we did in 2016? No. Summer of 2016, we, the BC Liberals, put on a 15% foreign purchasers tax on houses in the lower mainland. I think it was Kelowna and Victoria. Yeah. The NDP came in and expanded that. What happened after that summer of 2016, partly because the state of the world economy and so forth, is the number of foreign purchasers plateaued and house prices didn't budge a bit. No, they didn't. They kept going up. Yeah, 100%. We had all the registry information. It turned right. out the number of foreign purchasers was actually very small, range mm -hmm. of 3%. I mean, that's what my gut feeling is. Yeah. But so we come back to David Eby and say, you've already got all the information, prove your case. Well, but he doesn't. I mean, he's got information from 2016, but there's no, a lot. No, there's been declarations ever since then. It's still yeah. required. It was since 2016. Yeah. But I'm talking about all the people before that. I'm talking well, about the people that. How are you going to do that? Well, if someone's <laughs> bought a house, you know, 10, 10 years ago and it's 2010. Their name's on the land title office. But does that tell you that whether they're, I mean, it shows their name, but was, so there's, we can dive, we can go down the rabbit hole of like corporation. But help corporate. me here. Yeah. What's the goal? Is it to figure out what happened in the past or to solve problems for people going into the future? Well, yeah. Sometimes you figure out what errors you made in the past to help create policy for the future. That's my idea. But we have the information since 2016 and what difference has it made? Well, like I, would, I, would make the, way, I would make the argument, I would make the argument that, that, there was not a lot of uh, there was not a lot of resistance for foreign investors to invest in BC before you guys implemented that foreign home buyers tax. But what are you going to do with that now? We've already put on foreign buyers taxes. Mm. The NDP raised it to twenty percent. It's still an unaffordable market. Sure. Well, I mean, if I were to take be a devil's advocate here, I would say, well, by having the data, I might be able to justify the reason to get rid of the foreign home buyers tax. I mean, I I actually think you guys implemented the, the data is all there. So you have a name of an individual registered, but you don't know what their citizenship is. Sure you do. They had to pay that to declare their citizenship in order to buy the property to see whether or not they were subject to foreign buyers tax since the summer of 2016. But and before take the that? Point, hold on, take the point. New Zealand instituted a ban on foreign ownership. Yeah, which except, I know Andrew Weaver was big on. I think it's a ridiculous well, concept. Well, except but. Uh, citizens of Australia which is five times the population of New Zealand <laughs> right. and Singapore okay. for reasons that you and I wouldn't understand. Yeah. So what's happened? Nothing. Not much change. Right. Well, kind of that, I mean, that speaks to what my view is, which is, is we've had such cheap, cheap access to credit for so long. I think that's the number one reason that's driven up real estate prices beyond anything else. In and my so view. that's a legitimate thesis. So that's not going to change by finding out the name and nationality of the person on the title. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to think- That comes back to what we're talking about. Sure. There's so much money washed into the system after 2009 that people who accumulated money, the one percenters, were able to drive up the price of everything worldwide. Mm -hmm. And that's going on again now, because as you know, all of the Western governments are pumping cash into our economies at a furious rate. Mm -hmm. And you know we hear that sales volumes on houses are way down, but the prices are staying high. They are. There aren't many sales, so we'd have to no. see how it pans out. Property but I hope you take this as the, the kind of uh, engaged discussion that I love to have with people. Yeah, I do, yeah. man. This is great. This Good. is excellent, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. Um, before we jump into tax policy and political messaging, I want to I want to talk a bit about the property transfer tax. Sure. Okay. So I've got the numbers here as far as the, the so it's it's one percent. It's kind of meaningless, especially here in the Vancouver area. But one percent on the first two hundred thousand dollars, two percent on two hundred thousand dollars to two million. Then it goes to three percent for homes of two million 
to 3 million, which is pretty much most of Vancouver. Uh, and then you get an extra 5% on anything above $3 million. Now, one of the things that I think this current government has completely missed the boat on here is they increased, they increased the property transfer tax when they got into power with the idea that, well, we're going to really you know, go after the wealthiest of the individuals out there. But oh, they're going after anybody who's accumulated assets. Sure. But here, here's the thing. It doesn't make any sense to me. The idea, every, every tax policy that I've seen the NDP implement, and this is where I have uh, argued this with David, that around, around uh, these taxes all wrote about chronic, trying to create a more fair system and create more affordable housing. Now, the thing is, if your house is worth $5 million, that's not an affordable home. But what you've done by increasing the tax threshold on the property transfer is, and I'm a free market kind of guy, you're going to discourage people from moving their houses. They're going to hold them Correct. for longer. But actually, the only time you as a government get paid on a property transfer tax is when the property transfers. Correct. <laughs> it's like the realtors. You guys, as a government, not you, you, but the, the NDP, and the realtors are in the same bed with each other. Like they only get paid when property transfers. Yeah. So I actually have this idea, this policy. I want you to take, take this away to think about. I actually think they should have a policy that says if your house exceeds the value of $5 million and you sell your house within two years of buying it, your property transfer tax is no longer 5%. It's like 2%. And we not only, instead of what Dave is talking about, which is discouraging uh, uh, speculation in the real estate market, I say discourage it at the affordable housing level and encourage it at the unaffordable level. <laughs> but, get all the rich people out there. Yeah. And maybe they're even foreigners. Let the foreigners come back in. Get rid of the foreign home buyers tax. Let these rich dudes from across overseas somewhere buy their $15, $20 million mansion and even encourage them to have it for only two years almost like rent it, right? And then have them pay a small amount of property transfer tax, but at least as long as they're moving the real estate around. And look, a $10 million house that drops by 50% in value is still not affordable to the average British Columbian. Yeah. Let's back up a little bit and talk about taxation of the individual. Canada brought an income tax in 1917 to pay for World War I, the first time. Canada brought in capital gains tax in 1971 for the first time because income tax uh, was then at a fairly high level and the expectations of government were rising because of the Medicare came in in a big way in 1967. So governments needed money to pay for Medicare. So they instituted capital gains tax, very controversial at the time. Mm -hmm. And so the idea became, and still is, if you sell a single family dwelling Within a year, you have to pay capital gains tax because you're really in the business of flipping houses. Mm -hmm. So the idea was capital gains for people who flipped them over and income tax remained, actually went down a little bit because you had different channels of taxation. What the NDP are very keen on, having read that Thomas Piketty book from France about capital in the 21st century, is starting to tax people's assets. And that's become quite clear. They dress up their speculation taxes dealing with speculation. It's got nothing to do with speculation. We have suggested a true speculation tax, which would be to increase the capital gains tax on people who flip paper deals for condos. Make it sure. less attractive to flip the paper deal because you won't make any money. Mm -hmm. That will have the effect of keeping the price of those newly built condos manageable, probably at the initial list price, and keep the market open for younger people who are looking for their first place to live. And that's they the beauty of a, of a, in my view, of a, a solid tax policy is because, and if they can make money enough to, to justify the tax, at least to pay the tax. Yeah. And then you can so apply that tax to something else. Your proposal and mine are in opposite directions because I'm saying you can deter speculation in the condo market, the presale market, by requiring people to register those deals like the, at the land title office. And then if they flip them, they've got to pay a bigger capital gains tax, mm. which will mean they won't bother to do it. Your idea of encouraging people to sell their property more frequently would encourage the speculative market. No, no I'm talking about, about for a certain threshold. But then so you're talking, I'm talking about, about like 5 million, 10 yeah, million and above. But you're talking about a special deal for the super well off. And mm -hmm. that grates on most Canadians. Yeah, or you could make the argument that if the whole theme here is to create tax policy 
that discourages speculation in the, and, and ra- running up prices of homes, then I support your idea. My idea also is a complement to it because it's a different sector. What I'm saying is, at the end of the day, if you have a 5% property transfer tax at, for homes that are valued at $3 million and above, now as a person who's buying or selling that market, I'm going to think twice about whether I want to sell my house because the amount of tax I have to pay. So if I don't sell my house... Remember, you yeah. don't pay the tax and you sell. You pay it when you sure. buy. Sure. Okay. But it's all factored into the decision-making of buyers yeah, and sellers. But so the, the fact of the matter is if you sell your $10 million house to somebody down the street, they're going to pay $10 million plus the 5%. Yes. It's a tax on assets that the NDP have dressed up as a transfer tax. Right. And you're suggesting that that tax should be reduced to encourage more market activity. I'm saying that doesn't sit well with most Canadians that the super well-off get a better deal than the regular folks. Well, maybe make it the same as what the lower ones are. All I'm saying is that by raising that tax, you're actually discouraging activity. And if you're discouraging activity, I mean, I look at and go, I don't really care. Here's a great example you might get to. Okay. Progressive income tax. Yes. Uh, Some places, including Alberta in the past, have had a flat rate income tax. There's a certain threshold you pay nothing below, and then after that, it's X percent. And that encourages certain kinds of behavior. And if you're the cardiac surgeon, you're laughing because you don't pay much tax on the large income you're making. If you're the regular folks, you say, well, why is the cardiac surgeon being paid a ton of money and pays the same level of tax I do? So the solution in Canada to less extent the USA, certainly the UK, all of Europe is progressive income tax. Mm-hmm. And in the UK and Canada and the USA, the maximum rate in the late 50s and through the 60s was like 75%. It got up to 95% at one point in England. When you 95? remember that George yeah. Harrison song, The Tax Man? Yeah, okay. The Beatles all moved out of England in the mid 60s because the taxes are so punitive. They were the biggest pop success yeah, ever. Sure started making money and then realized that's all I get. Yeah, the rest was taken by the tax man, the George Harrison song. (laughs) I didn't know that. So through the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s, there was the Reagan-Thatcher approach, which said, well, no, you actually want to encourage prosperity. So stop taxing people at a punitive rate, 60, 70, 80% on the upper incomes. Bring that down to encourage investment and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. The chronic question is, what's the right top marginal tax rate. Sure. And the NDP like it to be up in the mid 50s. And we as BC Liberals say you shouldn't get above about 50% because you're just deterring people from working harder. Okay, well, you must have been reading my notes upside down here, Andrew, because this is like exactly <laughs> what I re- wrote. This is a great segue into my tax policy question. So I don't mind, pa- uh, I'll just read what I wrote here. I don't mind paying uh, my fair share, but I want to make sure that the tax policy makes sense. We really like to talk about how many of the taxes implemented are raised since uh, the NDP formed government. I'd, I'd like to talk about that, particularly those around real estate uh, that punish me and people like myself, savers. But let's jump into your topic. So before uh, before you and I met, I was paying 48.9% marginal tax. Right. And if anybody that knows me knows, I was completely fine with that. Then, you know, I was like, ah, you know, I, I pay a lot of tax. I pay a lot of tax. But you can afford but it. I can, I, you know, and you I, get something for it. Yeah, I look at, I, I, I'm a, my kids are fourth generation Vancouverites. I live in a wonderful part of the world. It's a safe place to live. It's a wonderful, like this is a wonderful province and a wonderful city. My whole psyche has changed when I went, when all of a sudden it was announced, I'm now paying 53 and a half percent tax. I all of a sudden called up my tax lawyer, Tim Brown. It's a little plug for Tim over at RBS. And I said, Tim, you know all those ideas you've been throwing at me for the last three years? And he's come with some pretty crazy schemes on ways that I could save on taxes. Ways to arrange your affairs. Exactly. I said, you know what, Tim? I've had enough. It's all legal. It's, oh, it's all legal. Oh yeah, it's all legal. It's not, not It's not even offshore. It's all legal in, in, in stuff. I, it just requires time and work. And I said, but you know what, Tim? Now, starting today, every dollar I make I got to give 53 and a half cents of that dollar to the government. And that to me is just wrong. It doesn't, dis- it just completely, it takes the wind out of my sails as an entrepreneur who's taken all the risks to be successful. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, this didn't come as a guarantee. You don't have to explain it. I get it. Uh, yeah, you're, yep. you're drinking my Kool-Aid. Okay. <laughs> well, so, to a degree. Okay. So yeah. do you believe in the idea? I mean, my, my belief, 
we, we talked about this at your little your luncheon event that I attended, and I said to you, Andrew, what are your views of uh, going over fifty percent? Because I think at the time it hadn't happened yet. And you said, if it is, I'm out of here. I think it was tongue in cheek. Well, but, so think, what are your views yeah. on this? 53 and a half percent. The problem we have is that compare us to Washington state. Sure. The state income tax in Washington state and Texas and Florida and a number of other states is zero. So if, as I was out in the Fraser Valley talking to a guy who's in the window and door manufacturing business, has a big operation in the Fraser Valley, but with the NDP tax policies, he now says his plant in Sumas, Washington is where all investment is going because he's being so penalized here that why would he invest any more money in, in British Columbia when he can have the same product produced in Sumas, Washington, which is about 30 miles from where he lives. Right. And he can just go down there to visit if he needs to manage the place or for that matter, just yell across the fence. Yeah. So that's the problem. We have to have competitive tax rates or we will lose people, we will lose companies, we will lose investments. British Columbia has lost many head offices in the last decade because of tax policy. And we can't afford to continue doing that. Or we'll be basically desperate to find meaningful work for the young people coming out of universities. The counterpoint is we pay significantly higher taxes than most juris jurisdictions, but we get healthcare that's free at the point of service. We get very good universities at a very reasonable price. So that's the trade-off. And you and I have decided to stay here for a whole bunch of reasons, family, and also because we thought it was a fair deal. When the NDP start cranking up taxes, people like you start to think of their options. And particularly the 25-year-old thinks about their options. And here's a pretty scary story. Major American multinational based in San Francisco that we all know the name of. Uh, one of my children's friends got a job as an intern at that company for $92,000 US per year. Wow. Because of COVID, they were told, oh, you better go home. You're moving to Canada, where you're from. Your pay is going from 92,000 US to the Canadian rate, which is 54,000 Canadian. So she got paid two and a half times as much in the US to do exactly the same job because it's all virtual now. Sure. So we are at risk here of becoming the place that services America. And we can't carry on like that. Absolutely. So we need that investment. We need the entrepreneurialism here. We need the rewards for investment here. And the way to make it more equitable in income taxation is to do what has been done in the past you move up the bottom bracket below which people pay nothing. Absolutely. I love that idea. It was moved up to about 15,000 20 years ago. It needs to move up again. If you're going to give a break in income tax, you start with the people who need it the most. Yes. So and you, you also remember. don't deter entrepreneurism. So what number would you make that, Andrew? Wait till the general election. <laughs> <laughs> Much as I like you, I'm not telling you now. <laughs> I think it should be closer to like 30, in my view, because in my view, especially, and maybe it should be indexed to where you live, because obviously living- like yeah, That's pretty tough to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's probably hard to do. Uh, but it's bad to, enough to do it between provinces, let alone between cities. <laughs> but, you know, at $30,000, man, I, I, my, my staff here, I, I actually paid, uh, for years I've paid a, uh, a living wage uh, subsidy, as long as we hit certain uh, numbers on our, on our sales, yeah. just to help these young people kind of stay ahead and keep them here. You bet. So they don't go away like you just described. Exactly. Um, you know, it's interesting. I got. I was just looking at me. I've got Ali uh, Tarani from Zymeworks. Oh, yeah. He's a he's, good guy. He's coming in on Monday. Yeah. And he told me we should be talking about this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, he only employs people with PhDs in biochemistry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I think the, the big picture here is we have to recognize that British Columbia is not an island in the world. What happens amongst the neighbors matters. And with this fast moving world that we had before the pandemic, mm -hmm. we get compared with Queensland, we get compared sure. with Birmingham, we get compared with New, New Jersey. Jersey. And so unless we can be competitive in that space, we will just slowly start to lose people. And we can't do that. We can't say to a 25 year old, you know, you actually were better off to go to Toronto or to uh, Philadelphia because we can't match that. The NDP will often use this phrase, and I'd love to hear what your rebuttal to this is. That we're just asking those who earn more or have more 
to just pay their fair share. Well, I looked at the uh, the podcast you did, I think it was two weeks ago or a week ago with the NDP MLA from Victoria. Yeah, Laurel. And yeah. she was talking about, very nice person. Yeah. She was saying, oh yes, there should be a 1% tax on people who have more than $20 million. You yeah. said, well, is that every year or is that <laughs> once only? Yeah. And she didn't know. Yeah. And I thought, oh my goodness, if that's the idea of NDP tax policy, they need to figure out what they want yeah. before they come and talk about it. Yeah. Uh, so 53.5% is what I'm paying today. Would you be in favor of lowering that highest marginal tax bracket back down below fifty uh, percent? We have to be competitive within Canada. Yeah. Under the NDP in the '90s, we got to the highest in the country with Newfoundland just below us. And Newfoundland is not a place where investors hang out. <laughs> and so, well, we're the, actually the now in line in. with the rest of. I mean, Ontario is fifty-four and a half. Well, uh, Ontario is still below us, as but, you probably know. Ontario has the largest sub-sovereign debt in the world. Right. Yeah. Three hundred billion U.S. Four hundred billion Canadian that they have to pay back somehow. Mm -hmm. So that's why they have big marginal tax rates. So we have to be competitive within Canada. We can't be the highest, and the NDP seem to be think it's a great idea to have the highest taxes in Canada. Mm -hmm. Christy Clark and your party uh, implemented a surtax, whatever you called it, and it was it was a two percent increase in income tax going back whatever it was, twenty fourteen or something like that for two years. And as long as you had a surplus for two years, you guys were going to lower it. You did. And I really liked that. It kind of encouraged me to go up to work every day and like contribute to the economy. Um, can you maybe speak to that? Do you remember which policy that was? I and I remember being and was, abused day in and day out by the NDP saying it was a tax break for the rich. And that's exactly what they will talk about for the next 10 years is that the BC Liberals think it's good to pay off rich people nonsense. I just said the way you start tax reform on income tax is to start by moving up the number below which you pay no tax to help the people who need it most. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to hear that because they have this uh, propaganda machine that says that somehow we only want to help people who drive fancy cars. For goodness sake, the reason I went into this line of work is to make sure that that kid graduating from John Oliver High School in East Van has the same crack at being successful as every kid in this province. Sure, yeah. The, th the one thing that I never really hear politicians speak about much is the amount of government waste that goes on. So we've talked, spent a lot of time here talking about tax policy. Before we talk about political messaging, um, I also look at what the government has at a federal level, a provincial level, and even here in Vancouver. And I also often ask myself, like, why do you need to tax anybody more? I mean, why why can't you guys just do with what you've got? I mean, there's a ton of waste that goes on. Tell me and, what you had in mind when you said waste, because this is an interesting conversation every time it comes up, getting people to define it and getting to say what they would do about it. Well, this is the beauty of, of financial statements and freedom of information requests. I've dug up all sorts of things. I mean, I mean, I won't go into much detail now because it'll bore the listeners, but the <laughs> central deposit program, for example, that you guys launched actually, and at the time it made sense, but the central deposit program really brought in a bunch of uh, cash that was sitting with uh, health authorities and school districts, mm -hmm. and it was meant to uh, reduce the amount of debt that was being borrowed by the province um, into the, in the financial markets. And at the time, the math made a lot of sense. The problem is that CDP pays this much in rate to these uh, to these institutions, to these school boards and, and, and hospital districts. And we're talking billions of dollars here. You mean an interest? An interest, yeah. So there's, yeah. A, there's a central deposit program that's administered through the CIBC. Yeah. And, um, and I've shown this to David multiple times. I've shown it to Andrew, uh, Andrew Weaver. I haven't shown it to you, but I'll show you my report. And then you look at the borrowing cost of the province of BC and the, different, the differentials change. Like when you guys launched this, your borrowing cost was here and what you were paying was here, so it made sense. But now there's the borrowing cost of the province of BC, because you know, knock on wood, we still have a AAA credit rating, who knows for how long, Yeah, um, is such a huge differential. It's, Give me some numbers. I'm not sure what kind of range you're talking about. Is this like 0.1% or 10%? Uh, we're talking about, uh, I think it's like 70 basis points in differential. So 0.7%. Uh, 0.7%. Yeah. yeah. So I think the end number is like right now it's costing us around $22 million a year of added interest costs. And this is a very financial model based kind of policy. Yeah. This is your turf. So, yeah. So yeah. we can talk about that. This is time. like you asking me about 
neurosurgery. I can sure. help you out with that. Would yeah. you like to talk about it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's pick one that I also was a big fan of that the NDP did. I know you wouldn't like probably, but because uh, it was a decision they made, but it was in closing down these foreign offices. Now, yeah. That's a very debatable thing that they did. Sure. And they did it very badly in a very ruthless way. They sent all of these people who'd been hired, sometimes Canadians, sometimes foreign hires into offices. I think it was 21 offices, mostly in Asia. And they just told them one day, you're let go, goodbye. Here's a severance. Mm -hmm. Forget it. But I, I wrote And a they had been told earlier that that would not happen. It was done in a very thoughtless and ruthless way. And as you say, in today's world, look in this harbor. We are extremely trade dependent here. Sure, but do we need to have trade offices in Beijing that are costing us north of $3 million a year? I mean- Well, there are optimal ways to do that. When yeah. I was a deputy minister responsible for that, we were doing it with contractors on a select basis and they mm -hmm. were basically traveling salespeople. Sure. Unless they brought in the deals, we wound them up. So mm -hmm. you'd say, look, you got a year to find deals. This is your territory. If you don't find them, then that'll be that. Mm -hmm. That's one model. Another model is to do nothing at all and see what happens. And then there's the trade office model. And the NDP have gone from 100% to 0% overnight. That's not going to work. Mm -hmm. How about I will reverse the question and ask it to you. Sure. You, you must see government waste. There's got to be some programs that whether it's one of your legacy programs under the BC Liberals or a current NDP program that you see as being government waste. I see it all the time. Yeah. I, I mean, I got to think, I got to hope that you do see it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I like to talk about stuff that's going to make a big difference to people's daily lives. Sure. And the treasury program you talk about, I barely understand what you're talking about. It yeah. doesn't make a lot of difference to the people on the street. It's a $65 billion budget now. BC government, since they've added on an extra $5 billion, spends about $7.5 million an hour, every hour of every day. $120,000 a minute goes through the bowels of the BC government. It's all tax money. So you got to make sure it's being used effectively and efficiently. So this is a constant process of finding better ways to do things. And government usually lags because even things like moving stuff to the internet. You know, I went on the property tax website the other day and thought this is an extremely customer unfriendly thing because it's designed for older people and you can't tell where you are in the web page. What does that do? That generates phone calls, that generates call centers, that generates a whole bunch of inefficiency. Get a better website, pay somebody who knows what they're doing to set it up once and get a website that's highly functional, that's as good as the commercial websites. And then you will actually serve the customer better, the citizen, you'll save money and you'll put a smile on people's faces rather than making them say, I cannot stand dealing with government. Mm -hmm. ICBC is the one that jumps off the table. It's been, a state-run monopoly for 47 years now. And I say, people deserve a choice. Let there be a decision made by the person who's buying insurance. And something I raised two years ago is in the taxi business, in the commercial trucking business, why aren't they allowed to have a choice? Let the commercial insurers come in. If they can give the taxis, there are 5,000 of them, or they can give commercial truckers, there are probably 20,000 of them. If they can give them a better deal, so be it. Why is there this government monopoly that insists on owning and hoarding everything and then hoarding information and really has lost uh, the idea of customer service long ago? So you can clean up a lot of things by creating more responsive vehicles of government. And to me, ICBC is up for a overall review to figure out why we still have it. So that would be one of your first projects to tackle from a government waste perspective if you well it's you don't want to jump into waste right away but when you see something that's been a monolith for 47 years mm -hmm. unchanged you say well maybe we should have another look at this because surely there are uh, better models around the world and all through the common law world nobody does it like we do mm -hmm. We are the only ones in the world who do it this way. Mm -hmm. Are we so clever that everybody else missed the opportunity? Right. Or are we so out of step and they've moved on and we're still stuck in the 70s? That's, a That's tough, the kind yeah. of thinking I bring to this. Right. Is starting to ask those questions. Why do we do it this way? Sure. I do think that as far as, and this will lead into our political messaging, I do think that if there's something that you guys should do more of, in my view, Andrew, my unsolicited advice is speak more about this because there are a lot of people out there like myself who do pay a lot of tax, happy to pay tax. I don't like, I'm not happy paying 53 and a half. I'm happy to pay 48.9. 
but I get really frustrated when I see the amount of waste that goes on. Yeah, And I understood. think cleaning that up, because my view is, maybe it's a little bit jaded, but my view is it seems like politicians on the whole don't really care that much about how much is being spent. And it would be really refreshing to see. You have no idea how <laughs> thrifty I am. Okay. <laughs> I use tea bags twice. <laughs> That's good. We recycle Ziploc bags until they tear. So do we. <laughs> you have no idea what thrift looks like until you okay. come into my household. Who, who do you have as your critic uh, for the Ministry of Finance? That's a combination right now of Shirley Bond from Prince yes. George, who's been in office for 19 years now and knows government up, down and sideways. And Stephanie Kajir from South Surrey. Yeah, that's right. South Surrey. And she's been uh, elected, I think, since 2009. It might be 2005. Yeah. They both know the ins and outs of this. They've both been cabinet ministers. Between the two of them, they've got almost 30 years of experience in cabinet. So they know where the snakes are under every rock. Okay. All right, Andrew, last topic here. Sure. Political messaging. Effective political movements seem to increasingly revolve around simple, bold ideas. Defund the police, no pipelines, build the wall. How does a party that makes a point of moderation and responsibility build an identity in that environment? What are the liberals, BC liberals, big, bold ideas? Yeah, and this is a combination of good public policy, election platform, and straightforward communication. Yes. And it's always a challenge when you're talking about something that's a little more nuanced. But on the ICBC thing, we've been saying for three years now, you deserve a choice. It's a very straightforward message. And that seems to resonate with people because they get a little tired of being told, here's your bill for $6,000, pay it or else you can't drive. Mm -hmm. And you know that usually happens to young people. And it's often their parents who are involved. And they say, yeah, well, why do we have to go with the state-run monopoly all the time? Sure. Why are we being basically browbeaten into this by the government? Government's supposed to serve you, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole theme that we've got out there. You know, we'll be running a, a platform that's got driving interest in enterprise, in education, the state of the economy, environment, affordability. What do you think are going to be the big game-changing themes uh, for you to get reelected, considering we're in the middle of this global pandemic right yeah, now? It's very hard to say. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing is on disease control, on getting the virus under control, British Columbia has done very well. The people of British Columbia really rose to the occasion, listened to Dr. Henry, and we're in today, and keep your fingers crossed, very good shape in terms of getting the virus under control. We are in very poor shape in terms of any economic plan to get us out of this and create prosperity again. Mm -hmm. The classic example is tourism. 130,000 people work in tourism in this province. This will be the worst season since probably World War II. Yeah. And the NDP excluded them from their economic recovery task force. And the tourism they excluded minister them. excluded them. On Monday, the tourism minister was asked, so it's going to be a totally different landscape. What are you going to do? Is your budget going to increase? Are you going to do something differently? Her answer was, no, the budget will remain the same. We haven't got any plans to change the ministry's work. And you sit back and think, are you crazy? I mean, don't do that in the well, hospital system. Reality. <laughs> oh, completely. So we'll be pushing the NDP really hard in the next five weeks in the legislature to tell us the truth about the state of the province's finances and to come up with real measures to make British Columbia prosperous again. Well, I mean, Andrew, this goes right back to my first, our first theme, which is transparency in government. In my view right now, since this is such a unique global phenomenon, we should be getting updates every month. Just in the same way we get yeah. updates on the number of COVID cases. I go I beyond know, that. I want, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I, like, I want to know what the financial state of our province looks like. We get a draft budget on February 10th each year saying what the revenues will be for the period from March 31 that year to the following March 31. They currently say there'll be $8 billion in sales tax revenue. That is not true. You and I know that. Everybody in this province knows that. Why can't you tell us the truth? You have the sales tax remittances for the month of March, the month of April, and the month of May. Mm -hmm. Tell us what they are. The federal government's coming out with a complete financial update on July the 8th, and the province is muttering about doing one on July the 14th, only because the feds have done it and we're pushing them for it. They know the, the uh, gasoline sales on a daily basis. So they know exactly where their revenue projections are going on things like alcohol sales, they control the liquor distribution branch, sure. sales tax. But they this is the, the kind of data you're talking about when the beginning of our podcast. Put it you on the just, table. Sure. Yeah. 
I mean, this is not privacy issues. I mean, how much alcohol is being spot, sold, consumed? Totally, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it, it's distressing to us that they're maintaining, they want us to pass that budget from February 10th as if nothing has changed. And we say, why won't you tell us the truth? Mm -hmm. That's a core theme of what's going on during this pandemic. And that's not going to get people back into employment. But what it does do is help us to prod the NDP on where they're missing things. We started on May the 5th writing letters to Premier Horgan. We've done a dozen of them so far. There are 60 ideas in there to get this economy back on its feet. They accepted three of them. What are the three they accepted? Liquor uh, at wholesale prices for the time being. We said make it permanent for restaurants. Cut what their cost base. Can you say for layman's, what does that mean? Right now, if you open a restaurant, yeah. you pay the same price for the liquor that you do in the liquor store that you and I pay. Even though you buy 100 cases a week, you still pay retail price. Right. Wholesale price is significantly lower. Yes. And so why can't the restaurants buy at a wholesale price? So they have never been able to do that? No. They're also not allowed to go to the liquor store next door and buy a bottle. They have to order it from the liquor distribution branch and wait for it to be delivered. This is nuts. Wow. So that was number one. Number two was uh, make sure that if patios get expansions from city governments, yes. that the liquor license applies to the whole thing. You don't have to apply for an extension of your liquor license. They sure. accepted that idea. Okay. And the third one? Uh, third one escapes me right, right. now. It was okay. another restaurant issue. This is, I'm going to digress for just a second, Andrew, because I want to jump to the theme of cannabis. Oh, yeah. Um, I didn't have it on here, but you brought up liquor. And, uh, and, you know, in fairness to David, he did help out uh, in having a conversation with one of my good friends who runs one of the largest retail cannabis stores in the country. And that, uh, that uh, friend of mine was advocating that the BC government do the, follow the provincial government in Ontario and allow sort of door to door delivery. Oh, the theme here is that what's going on right now. Uh, the third one came back to me. Yeah. What is it? allow permanent home delivery of alcohol from restaurants. Okay, okay perfect. Well, and this is the theme we're talking about. And the about. NDP have said, okay, we'll allow it temporarily. Yes, that's right. And the that's whole gist of this is if you're in a restaurant now, you're in deep trouble. Yeah, absolutely. So find ways to make them more profitable because about 10% of them are estimated to never open again. Yeah, sure. Most of them are losing money hand over fist right now because mm -hmm. people just aren't going in. Yeah. So reduce their costs. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to reduce their costs... There aren't many people getting rich in the restaurant business. No, not so at all. they're just trying to survive. Reduce their costs permanently. Yeah. Anyway, I interrupted so, you. No, no, this is perfect. Actually, that was great because this individual, and I won't name just because he, I mean, oh, anybody fair. who's listening will probably know who he is, but just in case he didn't want me to, he's also one of the largest bar owners in the city. So he already knows about this model because he's able to deliver food from his, uh, food primary re uh, restaurants with right. his alcohol yeah. and he's but he also is the largest owner of cannabis stores and he's going i can't do it over here and the the feedback he's getting from his young millennial staff that work at these places is the drug dealers are taking over well because i don't think they ever let go actually no and not, what happened in it's canada gotten worse you know what happened in october 2018 the federal rule came in that cannabis is no longer an illegal product and it could be sold and there was that whole phenomenon in the run up to it, I think it was 27, 18, 18 now, that there are all those gray market stores that opened, put up a sign in front, so they weren't exactly hiding, but they were unregulated. Mm -hmm. And we said right at the outset, when that started happening in 2017, 18, look, regulate this thing. If they're selling to minors, prosecute them. Marijuana is not good for the brain. Mm -hmm you know, for teenagers. Mm -hmm. So make sure you're not selling to teenagers at a kind of get them hooked and profit mm -hmm. basis. Keep the product generic. Don't make it whiz bang, this is fun, let's all get stoned. And make it all private. I don't know why government would be in that business at all. And the NDP ignored all of those. So now we're left with a situation where the private stores, which are mostly licensed now, it's been extremely slow, mm -hmm. have a higher cost base than the black market. So yeah. The black market is doing just fine because the NDP made it and too expensive. Are tied about to how they can service the market. Interesting story. Uh, remote relation of my wife is a police chief in a small city down the I-5. They legalized marijuana about five years before BC did in Canada. So I see him every Christmas and I say, so how's it going? He said, well, marijuana actually worked out pretty well 
because the state takes a 25% cut at wholesale and another 25% cut at retail and the black markets disappeared. And oh, that sounds great. So I heard that in the, the Christmas of 2017 and it's been botched here. The black yeah. market's alive and well here because sure. they've made it too onerous here in British Columbia. It, it, we talked about this earlier, whether it's housing and foreign buyers, whether it's marijuana retail, whether it's restaurants, whether it's income tax, do stuff that works. Sure. Don't get high on, on your high horse and refuse to be flexible. Well, you know, if in, it's in not fairness working, to, in, fix it. Yeah, I agree. And in fairness to David, he did take the call with my my good friend, and he actually had all the people that were involved at the uh, at the at the staff level to listen in. The problem was that call was like six weeks ago, and we're six weeks later, and it still hasn't changed. It's and not David's department. So right. David yeah. should have dragged in the Solicitor General, Mike. Farnworth, Maybe he was in it. I don't know. Or the meeting's a waste of time. Yeah. But I can say I can say that when I look at the policy that sounds like you guys proposed or pushed hard on, which is home delivery of alcohol with your meal from the restaurants, is all that these guys are saying. Because and and uh, and my good friend has a good point. He said, like, look, when the drug dealers are doing it, you got three problems. Number one, you're not getting tax revenue when they're selling it. Number two. There's a quality control. Now you have it laced with all sorts of materials. You Who don't, knows what you're getting? Exactly. And I don't remember the third one either, but those Number are the three two is probably ones. eating and abetting criminals <laughs> in a country that's supposed <laughs> to have the rule of law. Sure. Anyways, you take that one home this weekend. Maybe you can get, yeah. get you guys yeah. on that on next but week. I think about, we're talking about the same thing at the end of the day. We are. Do smart stuff that works. Be transparent. Encourage prosperity. Let people get ahead encourage those kids in high school and university and college to say, I'm going to have a chance to live just as well as my parents do. Mm -hmm. And right now, we're unfortunately in a world where all those young people who have 30% plus unemployment and are losing their term in college university, like my daughter did, are saying, I don't know where this is going. And their parents sitting at home are saying, well, one of us is on CERB and the other one's not sure about their business is going to survive. We need guidance and leadership from the provincial government, and we are not seeing it. So what do you, so let's, that's a perfect segue back in to wrap this up with the political messaging. What are you going to do to show that leadership, or what are you doing today? Small things are indicative of where you get started. Okay. Strata insurance has gone through the roof. Yeah, you've been talking Half about that. Half of the yeah. people in the lower mainland live in condominiums. They have no idea how much they're going to have to pay in strata. Why has it been going to roof, Andrew? In layman's because terms, why? a bunch of insurers left the market. Okay. There were big claims elsewhere in the world. The reinsurers said, we're really not interested in this product line anymore. So the insurers said to each other, maybe they don't talk to each other, but they said, look, if we're going to take on this risk, we better charge a bundle for it, and hopefully they won't buy our policies. And if they do, we'll be sure to make a profit anyway. So there's a glitch in the insurance market and government has to have a role in this. And we said right off the bat, what you start with is take the 4.4% tax off insurance that the government pockets from these increased, it's a windfall for government at the expense of the condo owners. Right. So there are dozens of things you can do. Well, that's along the same lines people. of your, your gas tax, removing that when the prices got really high. That exactly. You know, Talk concept. about this through the lens of the citizen, to the person who is a belongs here in BC. Treat them with respect. Mm -hmm. Don't treat them like the NDP do, which is a vehicle for government to collect things and tell them what's good for them. Mm -hmm. The NDP in BC here have got a pretty big following right now. They've given a lot of things to a lot of people. I think you guys got a tough road ahead of you to try and get reelected as government. I'm just being honest with you. It doesn't yeah. I mean, where I sit as far as it, it doesn't really matter. I'm just giving you what I think is a, a fair comment. So let's to finish this up, let's really hear that pitch on what are some other like tangible, real things that are bothering British Columbians today that differentiate you guys and why they should be voting for the BC Liberals in the next party and not for the BC NDP? Sure, I'll do it as a comparison. Sure. Personal income tax, the NDP believe, tax people until they squeal. We say you got to have competitive <laughs> tax rates it's across good. Canada or people will move, their yes. kids will leave. And remember, we've got a, the big sucking sound of America down south where a lot of people go regardless of who the president is. Mm -hmm. Secondly, on property, Talk about making affordable housing by increasing the supply of housing. Apart from this pandemic glitch, 350,000 immigrants come to Canada every year. I'm an immigrant. 
So they're coming to British Columbia. When I arrived here, there were 1.6 million people here. They're now 5 million people. Mm -hmm. And it goes up by 60,000 people every year like clockwork, except when the NDP are in power in the late 1990s when it went down. (laughs) So anticipate that. In another 25 years, there are going to be one and a half million more people in BC. Where are they going to live? Build a plan. Talk about what the Fraser Valley is going to look like. Talk about what the cities are going to look like and work on that plan with the municipality. Where's the bottleneck there, Andrew? There are lots of bottlenecks. Where's the biggest ones? Is it the municipal governments holding things up? That's a factor, but they vary a lot. There are 23 in the Lower Mainland. Mm -hmm. There are at least seven in in the Greater Victoria area. And there's a lot of variance in terms of how they deal with things. But there is growth in some of those municipalities when they encourage it. Coquitlam's anticipating another 70,000 people. So that's a necessary thing. They've got the, the SkyTrain to make it workable. Let's get on with it. But you have to have a goal to work toward in terms of this being, we talk about Vancouver, a livable, successful place with good jobs where you can afford to get ahead. And if we have the housing crunch right now, the NDP have accomplished nothing about. We have declining incomes because of NDP tax policy. And we have the instability of head offices leaving this city. That's not a good program. Mm -hmm. That's a program to take us into oblivion. But the NDP seem to think that's okay. We talk about making all of British Columbia more prosperous. I'm from the interior, and I know that resource industries matter there, and we've got to be more respectful for them. The NDP are quite happy to see the the forest industry shrink and shrink and die and watch these towns just dry up and blow away. I can name three towns in the interior that are probably doomed because of NDP forest policy. How respectful is that of the people who live there? They're basically, as we've said um, on this issue of severance pay last week, it's basically government-directed bankruptcy. Sure. And that's not what governments are for. Governments are there to serve people, to help them with their dreams, to make it possible, to provide that good education, to make sure that there's a strong private sector, Mm -hmm. that investors, whether it's someone like you or otherwise, are saying, yeah, BC is actually very workable. We're going to make it work here. It's actually better to do it here than in Saskatchewan or in Missouri. Let's make it happen here mm-hmm. and let's hire those kids and when they might be 35 or 45 years old and make sure that they're able to prosper and get ahead. Mm-hmm. That's a whole philosophy of life right. is based on opportunity, not on redistribution with the NDP master plan. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. You you said you grew up in the interior. Oh, yeah. Where, whereabouts? Well, we arrived in Kamloops from Australia when I was four years old. Okay. And I grew up there, went through elementary and junior high school there. Okay. And it was wonderful. Yeah. So beautiful city. Camels love that place. And uh, I grew up in Port Alberni. Oh. Okay. So another mill. Weather's a little different. Yeah, a little different. Yeah, it's a little different. <laughs> but there, the the forestry sector was, was especially in the area. They drove era that, that town. 100%. Yeah. Now, here's an interest. Maybe you can speak to this. If you look at a political map of the sort of hotbed of the NDP and the hotbed of the Liberal Party, you guys have got the interior pretty much locked down for a long time now. We are well thought of throughout the interior. Yeah. Yet yet on the island where I grew up, I mean, in Port Alberni, I mean, no one got elected unless they had NDP after their name in in that town. And probably is still the same today. I'm not sure who the MLA is for that area. Um, Why is there such a contrast between the coastal part and the center of the province. And what do you guys think you need to change over there on the coast to be able to get those people to convert from orange to red? There are many different theories about this. Okay. And you have to start with the historical trends. Okay. So right now in Prince George, we have two very strong MLAs who've done a good job for their community, both former cabinet ministers. Yeah. They, That's Shirley um, Bond. And, and Mike Morris. Okay. And we've elected people in Prince George consistently since 1996. The NDP have had no chances there. So there's some momentum, there's a record, there's recognition, there's comfort and confidence. And so once you get a long string of people being elected, it becomes hard to change the channel. I see. And that's why 2001 was such a revolution because there were 77 liberals elected and two NDP. Right. And one of those is very close. It was almost 78 to one. So, There are a lot of reasons for this, local conditions, personalities, local issues, and a lot of history built into it. Okay. Now, before you go, uh, you'd put out a tweet just a couple days ago about a a new candidate you have for Oak Bay Gordon Head. 
Fantastic. I'm glad <laughs> you brought this up. Yeah, I want to talk about yeah. that. So, so this is the riding where Andrew Weaver um, is currently the uh, independent MLA, former yep. head of the Green Party. Uh, and I do want to get Andrew on here at some point. I know Andrew, and uh, I'd love to get find get the intel on what's going on, what went on between him and uh, Sonia and Adam. Yeah, yeah. I'll leave that yeah. between I'll you and that, them. Yeah. yeah, but talk about what the plan is here, because you guys made some reference to we could be weeks away from an election. I didn't realize that, but is that well? Two channels there. Let's talk okay. about Oak Bay first. Sure. So Andrew Weaver was a still is a prof at UVic. Yep. Uh, lived in the riding, came on quite strong in 2013, was the only Green elected, and then 2017, he was re-elected. He's not running again. He's quit the Green Party, yep. and he's got some personal issues that yeah. may make him decide to take other channels. We respect that. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, since I think 1996, it has been a BC Liberal riding. So for 17 years, oh, really? it was BC Liberal. And we have been very fortunate to nominate on Wednesday evening a woman who's about 55, who's a senior lawyer in Victoria, has lived in the riding for 35 years, went to high school with Andrew Weaver. All our kids live there. She is rock solid. And her name is Roxanne Helm. And we're going to do everything we can to get that seat back with her as our candidate. Now, Andrew has uh, announced that he's not going to rerun, but there's no by-election yet, right? Because no, he's still- No, no, that would yeah. depend on the seat being vacant and he's still the MLA. So what was this reference to we could be weeks away from a, an election? What was that reference? Well, to? John Horgan on June the 9th put out a video to the NDP faithful saying, get ready for a fall election. And Did he really? Yeah. Okay. And he said, you know, in fairness to him, a fall election or next year. Okay. So he's the guy who decides that, not me. Right, sure. So he's the one who has the option of generating election this fall. So we said to our people, look, it's up to Andrew Weaver to come clean about whether he's prepared to put together a snap election in the middle of the second wave of a pandemic. Right. You and I are hoping there isn't a second wave. Yeah. But Elections BC got directions from Dr. Henry saying it would be completely unreasonable to hold a general election during the pandemic right so lord knows why john uh, john horgan was talking about that it, to my mind it was quite irresponsible and he should reject that idea and just come clean and tell us it'll be in 2021 which is currently scheduled october of 2021 yes um do you think it's to your advantage if it's delayed longer oh who knows because okay. in the middle of this pandemic all of us know all bets are off right 520,000 british columbians don't have a job who were employed in May of 2019. Sure. So the it'd be a really odd time oh, to have an yes. election. The priority now is to make sure those people have some sense of confidence yeah. in the future. That's why we're over in Victoria debating a budget yeah. right now to make sure those people have some sense of security so they can move forward. Yeah. Because to talk about an election now, I think is really quite irresponsible. Yeah. We'll have to come up with the necessary platform to deal with the circumstances that are in play when the election comes into place. Yeah. And you and I would both say, tell me what the state of the world will be in February or March of 2021. The only responsible answer is, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Andrew, if people want to get involved in the BC Liberal Party, uh, you're obviously, I did also notice that you're still looking to add new candidates. You bet. To the platform. We have an open process. It's yeah. not like the NDP where you got to be one of the chosen ones. Anybody can put their name forward to be a candidate in this party. Okay. And uh, what's the process involved in that? Go to bcliberals.com. It's all laid out there. Uh, we're in the process of putting together nomination meetings uh, over the next few months. And there'll be a lot of excitement. We're getting excellent people coming forward of the caliber of Roxanne Helm. And uh, we've got Cheryl Ashley in Maple Ridge Pit Meadows, uh, Bruce Bandman in uh, Abbotsford South to replace Daryl Plekis. And... Uh, James Robertson in Port Moody, Coquitlam. These are people I am proud to be associated with and work. Great. Now, you can't run a political party without money. Correct. So what are the limits for people? I mean, a lot of our listeners are typically going to be able to contribute, you know, the maximum. There is maximums now. So what, what are right. the basic? Uh, Take them back to bcliberals.com. Yeah. And there's a donate button there. And you can go in there and, and give up to $1,250 per year. Only personally, no unions, no corporations, no societies, nothing like that. Yeah. Personal donation. You get a big tax receipt so that if you give the maximum, you end up paying about, I think it's $650. And the rest comes back as a tax rebate at tax time. Mm -hmm. And 
in addition to that, we encourage you to sign up as a monthly donor because then we don't bug you again and you get some <laughs> perks for being a monthly donor. See, I did the opposite. I just paid the max right away. And then when I get co- called, I say, oh, sorry, I can't contribute anymore this year. <laughs> <laughs> and the other beauty is if you contribute the max or become a monthly donor, we don't pester you for donations anymore. <laughs> Well, this has been great having you here, Andrew. Yeah. I really appreciate coming in. I Absolutely. know you were supposed to come in and you, you were supposed to come in and, it, and then the COVID hit. And I thought, well, if there's any reason not to come in, there'd probably be a good reason for yeah, it. Exactly. So I'm glad we finally were able to make this happen. I wish you the best of luck. It's been re- really great having you here. And I'd love to have you come in again sometime, maybe before the next election. Absolutely. Unless it's assuming it's not in the next two weeks. Uh, Andrew Wilkinson, leader of the BC Liberal Party. Thank you for being on our show today. Thanks. And let's never forget, this is a great place to live and it's up to us to make it better for everybody. We gotta have a province where everybody has that sense of opportunity, not just a few friends of the NDP.